This is it. Here we are. Sales Confidence, the first Sales Confidence event of 2022. I think we're in now. Um, I'm really happy that we've got the wonderful Owen Richard, CEO and founder um, of... Oh, sorry. I just I doubled up on screen time there. I could hear myself talking. So, um, so Owen... <laughs> You've you forgotten. Yeah, do you want to just... In, do you just want to introduce yourself while we're getting everybody warmed up? Um, yeah, sure. And let us know who you are. Yeah, well, seeing as you stopped halfway through, I better finish it, eh? So um, uh, my name's Owen Richards. I'm the CEO and founder of Air Marketing. Um, we're a proud sponsor of Sales Confidence, and I've been jo James's co-host of Sales Leaders Events for Sales Confidence since the middle of last year. Um, and yeah, really, really good to be here for the, the first event of 2022. We'll get some in-person events this year, for sure, but um, first one virtual, and it's good to be back for the year. Yeah, absolutely. So Owen's joined me as the co-host for a number of events over the last couple of years, and it just helps me balance the, the workload and the effort. So the purpose of today is to provide inspirational talks from some world-class sales leaders. And we've got a wonderful lineup of sales leaders today. We've got Chris Ashley from Peak, Anders Holmberg from Get Accept, Abby Williams from Own Backup, and Rebecca Drew from Vidyard. So the purpose is each speaker only has seven minutes to inspire you. So it's long enough that they can get their points across, but short enough um, that it has to be punchy and impactful. And that's the purpose of our seven-minute talks, is that they're punchy and impactful and can inspire you with their inspiration. Um, all talks are recorded and available on the Sales Confidence YouTube channel. And also there's a podcast. So if you go to any podcast uh, streaming platform, you can listen back to the talks next week um, at your own pleasure. So we're going to kick off our seven-minute talks. Then there's a panel discussion. So we will have Owen orientate the panel discussion. And then followed by the panel, we will have um, networking. So this is an opportunity to network and connect with people um, in your environment um, for two minutes. And then it's on a kind of rolling roulette, which is a lot of fun. So I'm going to introduce the first speaker. And then we'll kick off um, today's talks. Um, any questions, just ask them in the comment. Let us know where you're dialing in from. Um, remember to have fun and enjoy yourself. All right, I'll introduce the first speaker, Owen. Okay. Um, so first up, we've got the wonderful Chris Ashley, who is the Vice President of Sales of Peak. He's going to be talking about building a hypergrowth sales machine and we both discussed that there's a lot of hype around and a lot of myth around what it takes to build a hyper growth um, sales SaaS business. And I think it's double, double, triple, triple growth. Um, maybe Chris can clarify that when he comes online. But Chris joined Peak at the beginning of 2020 as their head of AI consultancy before moving into his current role as VP of sales. And before working at Peak, he held the position of head of strategy and business development at Human a 20-strong digital transformation consultancy in Manchester. Uh, Peak Health Companies put the power of AI at the center of all commercial decision-making to drive profit, growth, and enhance decision-making across the business. Hi, Chris, can you hear us? Yeah, all good, thank you, James. How are you? I'm very good, thank you for, our, thank you for being our first sales leader speaker of the year. I'm very excited, very excited indeed. I'm loving the energy. Good, uh, and we can see your slides clearly. So I'll leave it to you now. Amazing. Well, thank you for that warm introduction, James. Um, I think, uh, as James said, VP of sales at Peak. And today, what I want to talk about is building the foundations of a hyper growth sales machine and hopefully share some practical tips you can take away with you. Um, for those of you that haven't heard of Peak, James gave a brief intro there. But for context, we're a decision intelligence company and we help CPG companies, retailers and manufacturers like Nike, PepsiCo and Marshalls deploy AI throughout their end-to-end -end value chain with the goal of supercharging decision-making across sales, marketing, merchandising, supply chain, and logistics, driving massive uplifts in profit and growth. Um, and for further context at peak, uh, we have a global enterprise sales team of 50-ish strong across EMEA, US, and India. We have sales cycles between three to six months, and ACV is now in the mid to high hundreds of thousands, and we sell to a variety of C-suite personas 
across our key verticals. And we've had around 100% year-on-year growth for several years running now, uh, as James just alluded to, and, and we had triple growth for the for the two years preceding that. Uh, and we've recently been backed by SoftBank in our Series C. So that's a little bit of context, um, which will hopefully help colour what I'm about to talk about in terms of building a sales machine that enables consistent hyper growth. To do that, I'm going to take a step back to a formative experience I had at the start of my career, um, which has heavily shaped the way I personally think about uh, sales and business more generally. So I'm going to throw back to when I was 20 years old, uh, approaching my final year of university and starting to think about what I wanted to do with my life beyond going out four or five nights a week with my friends. And for a long time, I'd wanted to be in the police. I grew up in a relatively rough area just outside of Liverpool in the UK. And as such, I was around violence and crime from a young age. And I wanted to make an impact on that. I wanted a real challenge. And so the police really struck a chord with me. And whilst in university, Greater Manchester Police ran a recruitment drive to take 50 out of 5,000 student applicants onto a fast track program for leadership positions within the GMP force. I got through the paper sift process, initial round of interviews, and then I was invited to an all day assessment center where we were tasked with written tests, math tests, group exercises, competency based interviews with the chief constable um, and multiple role plays, which we all love. Right. Um, and I still remember the role plays as some of the most intense I've ever done in my career. So you'd basically be given a sheet of paper before you walk into a room. And the paper would say something like, you're the first responder to the scene of a race hate crime in a supermarket. You then open the door in front of you and immediately you're getting screamed at by an actor playing a distraught citizen with an invigilator sat calmly in the corner, observing your every move and your every word to, to measure your interactions with this individual. So it was super intense. And the actor was basically trained to have 10 gateways in their script. And if you managed to communicate and handle objections in a meaningful way, you'd unlock each gateway. Anyway, I did all right, um, and I was accepted onto the program. And I can still remember tearfully phoning my mum outside the recruitment centre to tell her I'd achieved a dream. It was quite overwhelming. Um, and a few days later, I got my offer letter in the post. A week following that, uh, myself and the other 49 successful recruits received another letter saying the program was being paused for a year, at which point the force would be in touch again. And that's because... This was the year 2008, and I was frankly oblivious and very naive to the ongoing session around uh, recession around us. Uh, it was a quid for a pint. Uh, it was 60p for the magic bus. The iPhone didn't exist yet, and we were all in our own blissfully ignorant student bubble. So fast forward 365 days later, after I received that letter, another letter arrived, and GMP terminated all 50 outstanding offers. So if you think about a young lad, 20 years old, um, achieved a dream, I, I was absolutely gutted and had to do a lot of soul searching at the time. But fortunately, that soul searching basically led me to some of the fundamental, fundamental ways and how to think about business today. So I very quickly had to reflect on the building blocks or capabilities I'd created and honed over my life to date that enabled me to succeed in that GMP process. And I then needed to map those capabilities to other career paths to figure out where is a strong fit and where my gaps were. So I was a decent communicator, empathetic, active listener, fiercely competitive, uh, relatively calm in stressful situations and so on. So I did that exercise and slight spoiler alert, given this talk today, it led me to sales. Um, now, this way of thinking about building blocks and capabilities has followed me throughout my career. And I've been really intentional about codifying what I've wanted to develop in myself and in my people and my teams, and then hiring and training based on those capabilities to create high performing teams that can achieve hyper growth. So what, what does that have to do with building a sales machine? Well, the sales machine in my mind and the way we've thought about it at peak is effectively the sum of all of your capabilities stitched together within your sales org. And what I mean by that is your people capabilities as the foundation, the dark blue layer, and then the process systems and data capabilities built on top of that foundational layer with culture and strategy infusing everything else throughout. And as we successfully stitch these sets of capabilities together, starting with that key foundation, we drive greater uplifts in the metrics and goals we all want to achieve. So ARR, NRR, ACV, win rate, et cetera. 
However, if we get the foundations wrong, we ultimately risk scaling something really, really quickly in a hyper growth environment that is eventually going to become completely ineffective and the machine effectively starts to crumble from the bottom at that foundational layer. So I can't talk fast enough to cover all of the capabilities on the screen in seven minutes. So what I'll do is focus on the foundational layer for the next couple of minutes. So at peak for a hyper growth enterprise sales org, there's a huge imperative to double ARR year on year and to get salespeople to full productivity and fully ramped as quickly as possible. So there's a number of key people-focused capabilities, roughly 12 or 13, we look for and continue to develop um, via enablement and coaching that have a direct line to the metrics that I mentioned earlier that we're looking to impact. So I'll share five of the key capabilities that, that we deeply care about of, of those 12 or 13. So at, at the front end of the sales cycle, during first calls and first meetings, we're looking for exceptional storytellers, people who can effectively capture a prospect's imagination when discussing the future of business and AI and bring to life how other companies are creating value on peak. And given we've created the decision intelligence category quite intentionally, this capability is even more critical. Um, so we know when we get this right, we're typically 70% more memorable. If we move further along the sales cycle to discovery, we deploy win teams at peak. So our salespeople need to be exceptional leaders in directing cross-functional teams of pre-sales. They're not just lone wolves. So they've got to work with pre-sales. They've got to work with data scientists, customer success, marketing and partners at pace and delivering real clarity to all of those different people in order to in order to win business. And if we get this capability right, we've seen we can increase win rates by two to three times. As we move through discovery and into business case and, and proposal building, rapidly creating clarity uh, externally with customers is a critical capability for us too. So given what we sell can be relatively nascent artificial intelligence in the minds of many of our buyers, the ability to guide a prospect as a trusted advisor via mutual action plans, locking in clear next steps, locking in meetings at the end of the meeting that you're in is absolutely critical for us. And this can lead to uh, as much as 4x win rate and a massive increase in pipeline velocity. And then across the end-to-end -end customer journey, we want high levels of attention to detail and customer obsession in every single interaction, which is often cited in win interviews as a major reason for uh, major customers going with peak. So these exceptional customer experiences, they resonate deeply with buyers versus just having a, a shit hot, amazing product. And developing this capability intentionally is really hard, but it's worth it as it leads to massive, it leads to massive uplifts in, in average order value. And finally, one for any Loon Shots fans in the room. If you haven't read this book, you definitely should. Um, at peak, and I'm sure many of you feel this way, it often feels like we're building a rocket ship whilst we're in flight because of the hyper growth nature of what we're trying to achieve. So as such, one of the key capabilities we choose to be really intentional about is who are our strategists, who displays um, you know, innovative strategic tendencies, who are our translators, who are the people that are amazing at taking great ideas and then figuring out how you actually operationalize them. And then who are the executors, who are the people on the ground that just deliver amazingly every single time with rigor. And by being intentional about this capability in sales in particular, it allows us to test new service innovations really quickly without breaking the sales process and confusing people. And it allows us to capitalize quickly on, on new differentiated product services, whether that's partner process um, innovations that, that have a massive impact on productivity um, per, per rep. So they're just the snapshot of the first layer of our sales machine, which drives 100% year on year growth for us today. Um, my advice would be to anyone um, who's going on this journey of trying to build a hyper growth sales machine. Step one, think about what unique capabilities you need in your sales org based on your unique product, your unique sales cycles, your unique average order values, um, and think about what you need to be successful in your sales org. Step two, build the people capability framework. And then step three, augment other capabilities like your hiring process, your sales boot camp, your ongoing enablement program, your coaching scorecards to laser focus on the things you want to develop in your people that will ultimately drive the biggest uplifts for your business. If you're interested in discussing any of that further, if you want to see our capability framework, if you want to show and share and, and uh, see what you've been up to, feel free to DM me on LinkedIn. And obviously, we can have a chat in the networking afterwards as well. So have a great day, everyone. Back to Owen. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Chris. Brilliant job. Great way to start the year. Um, absolutely love that your first slide was a hot fuzz slide, slide as well. My, my favourite ever movie. Um, very good. Very good start. I, I also really love the point around storytelling. Um, it was a fantastic point that we we retain more information when it's got a story behind it. I think that's something for us to, to, to take away. Guys, I put it in the comments. If you're watching this, if you've got questions for Chris or any of the speakers at the end of the session, we'll be hosting a bit of a round table and I'm happy to throw those questions at the speakers if you pop them into the comments. And as we'll already see from one, some of them will take the time to answer those in writing for you as well. So um, on to our next speaker, we move quickly with these events. So Anders Holmberg is our next speaker. He is the Chief Sales Officer at Get Accept. Um, and his title for his talk today is Scaling Revenue in 2022. He's gonna be talking about the top three focuses for 2022. Um, a bit about Anders, um, he joined Get Accept as their Nordic Sales Manager in 2016. Uh, before becoming their CSO in 2019 and describes himself as a true sales tech and SaaS junkie. Um, he's been part of the Get Accept team since really the very start um, as one of the very first employees and has been responsible for building out the sales organization from scratch there. And Get Accept changes and simplifies a seller's processes and allows the digital signing of the agreement to take place on the customer's terms with the seller's control. And as I keep hearing about Get Accept, I've met a number of your team. It feels like you guys are moving pretty quickly and trying to be very noisy in the market. So all good yeah. and positive things. Welcome. I'd love to, to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the um, Sales Confidence event. And is this your first Sales Confidence talk? Yeah, it is. So I'm very honored to be here. Uh, and thank you first off to, to Chris as well. What a great uh, way to start the day. And I love that story from, from you uh, begin in the beginning there. Love so, it. Um, well, the stage yeah. is yours, Anders. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, really great to be here. I'm Anders. I'm going to talk about some of my best tips on how to grow revenue in 2022. And if you're a sales leader like me, like many of us here, I think we can all agree on two things. Uh, one is there are so many opportunities right there uh, out now to, um, to massively impact the way that you sell and the way that you grow revenue. But there are also some unique challenges that we face now. As we know that the remote way of selling and leading will probably be here to stay, even though we're moving into a post-COVID uh, situation, uh, that means that we need to think maybe in new ways. So I'm a big fan of the rule of three. So I will talk about three different things that I think is the most important things to focus on. And number one, as Chris also mentioned, is the people, the culture, that is the foundation. So that is the number one. Number two is having a buyer-centric uh, view of the way you do business. And then number three is how you use and elevate data to take decisions. So you've heard these before, but I will try to put some of my words into this uh, and hopefully you can relate and get some inspiration. So first off, here at GetAccept, we uh, talk about and we joke about that sales is HR and HR is sales. And I think it's true. It all starts with the team and that is the most important things. Uh, so you need to have an engaged team. You need to have a team that feels that right where you have your workplace is where they want to be. And that is the foundation. There is such a huge demand for talent right now. I think we can all agree that it's maybe harder and harder to, to recruit. And uh, yeah, more and more people are actually adding people to their sales teams. Although many years ago, we talked about maybe that the sales um, uh, the, the sales would, would go down and be just automation sales, but uh, it's actually quite the opposite. So focus on your team first, and that means your hiring, your onboarding, but of course, also, of course, maybe having defined career paths for your sales team. Many that are working in sales now, they want to know, especially if they're quite junior, they want to know, okay, what's my next step? What can I develop into? So having that kind of clear career path I think it's going to be a vital thing for 2022. Secondly, it's the buyer experience. So whether you're using spin selling, maybe you're using medic, maybe you're using challenger sales, different ways of putting more or less the same words to your methodology. I think maybe now is actually really, really good timing to rethink how you do business. How are you being perceived when you do your meetings? How are you being perceived in between the meetings? when you follow up on your processes, when you try to involve all of the key stakeholders to try to help them take that decision. Hopefully that will be to partner up with you. Um, 
as many researchers say, uh, maybe especially Gartner, they came out with a study saying it's all about the best customer experience. The products are more and more similar out there. The offerings are more and more similar out there. It's all about how you make your customer feel throughout that buying cycle that will make a difference. And that will be the essence of why they choose you. So think about, for instance, how you can use video, social media, or even GIFs to stand out uh, and be memorable in sales process. And of course, also make it easy for your sales teams to have fresh and updated and easy accessible information that they can share in a nice way to your customers throughout their buying process because it's not so much a sales process it's more a buying process today so the third one is data and we all know data is gold and i think there are a number of things that we as sales leaders need to think about when it comes to data first off maybe the obvious you need to have control of your kind of key elements when it comes to your sales machinery. How many new opportunities are created? What is the ACV? Uh, how is the hit rate? And, uh, and how many days does it close to, take to close an average deal? If you're in control of those, then you have a, a foundation that you can work upon. And then, of course, you can divide that into different silos as well. Uh, but also thinking about your segmentation and ICP, I think as time, time changes so much now and the different verticals will be winners and with different verticals will be losers for sure in the new way of working. Uh, it's really good to have a kind of ch internal challenger mode and always think about should we redo our segmentation and, and our ICP so that is always updated. And lastly, make sure that you follow your cohorts, meaning that you look at your customers that you've closed on the historical period and see how they develop over time. Maybe you can see that some segments or some sizes, they scale much quicker than others. Uh, and then of course you should double down on that where you should maybe spend less focus on the ones that probably wasn't that good fit. So these are really, really important data metrics to have in mind. And if you have that, then you have the foundation of making good decisions along with, of course, the most important thing. So coming back to a summary, it is first off, start with the team, start with the people and make them feel engaged. That is the foundation. And then on top of that, we can build the processes. Then we can build on how we actually sell and then use data to take decisions. So that is my top three tips. And um, I promised our marketing general that I would mention one thing. So maybe you don't, don't see it now, but I have this awesome t-shirt here that says, I got 99 problems, but closing deals ain't one. So if you want one of these bad boys, then just write get accept or even your name maybe in the comments field and we'll make sure to, to bring you a t-shirt. So um, it's a very rare limited edition. So I hope that will something that, that you can like. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. Appreciate that. I'm just writing get accept for my t-shirt. Oh, um, we'll give you a, yeah, I think you've gotten a few already, James, but we'll, we'll give you another one. There's, there's, there's never too many. So as you heard from <laughs> Anders, they're giving away a free T-shirt, so stick, get accept in the comments, and we'll collate that afterwards and make sure you get your T-shirt. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. We'll have you back um, for the panel shortly. So next up, we've got the wonderful Abby Williams, who is the area vice president of Own Backup. Um, she's talking about recruiting the best, steps to take your sales team from average to awesome, talking about her tips around coaching and developing a sales team and the recruitment process to be effective. Um, she spent her time traveling the world in her early years installing hotel software and then running camps in Kenya and South Sudan. Um, from there, she spent the last 11 years in SaaS sales and she's someone that really loves what she does and hopefully that will come across with her enthusiasm in this seven minute talk, I'm sure it will. Um, she's currently the vice, uh, area vice president um, of sales for Own Backup for SMB in Amir, um, where she's grown the SMB team um, from the ground um, up. Uh, looking forward to her talk, and I'll invite her to the stage now. Hi, Abby. Hi, James. Thank you. Great intro, and I hope everyone is ready to be inspired. So let me uh, get started. Over to you. Perfect. Okay, so recruiting the best, right? Steps to take sales team from average to awesome. I have a very practical uh, presentation here, so um, I hope you are all inspired at the end of it. Uh, firstly, a little bit about Own Backup. So we were founded in 2015, but we've been listed on the Salesforce App Exchange since 2012. Uh, so that's nearly a decade. 
of providing backup and recovery software to Salesforce customers and also now uh, Microsoft and other platforms. Uh, we have seen 100% year over year growth for the last five years um, with 4,200 customers globally. So uh, a pretty a big powerhouse right now. A key part of our success has been the ability to hire in line with our revenue goals. So uh, we had 200 employees when I first started in 2019. Uh, and now we're at 800 and we plan to be at 1200 by the end of the year. So pretty lofty, ambitious goals. Uh, the good news is, is that we, once we find the right hires, um, our attrition rate is, is pretty low. So around uh, 17% compared to an average of 20-25% uh, in the industry. So in the seven minutes, I just want to lay out really uh, what, it, what the process is to build a high-performing SMB team that translates. Um, across really any sales org. So for me, as you can see, uh, this is very specific about high performing SMB teams, but for you, it could be enterprise, anything, any, any sales uh, role that you need to fill. And it's not just from a sales leader perspective, it's also from the candidates perspective. So um, it, whether you're on the chat, I saw some SDRs, I also saw some um, partnership directors, like this can go across the board really. So. Uh, I actually learned this process from our SVP of sales, Gareth Morris, and he took me through this process when we first uh, were going through the interview process back in, in 2019. And I was really impressed that he took the time uh, to coach me and that he was really involved in my success. And that was really important to me. So it, it resonated with me. So hopefully this resonates with you as well. Um, and also, I think both uh, speakers have touched on this, like the noise around the great resignation right now, um, you need to stand out in the crowd, right? As a candidate and as a, an employer, you have to be engaging and you have to, to stand out. Um, so here is my process. The first part of our process at Own Backup is we, we all have a hiring manager interview on YouTube in sales. Really powerful. It goes through, you know, why we joined Own Backup. What is our leadership style? Who are we looking for, and why? And how you can join um, our team. So this tool is really helpful to use before any interviews and also throughout the process. If you want to just have a connection or send um, uh, on LinkedIn, uh, it, it's it's great for all parties. So I'm just going to show you a quick snippet of this so you can see what we're doing here at Own Backup. And with all sorts of different backgrounds in sales, but for the most part, most of the AEs currently have been in sales development or business development and have been selling uh, as an account executive for on average of 20 years. As a manager, I lead with authenticity. And I think this took me a while to figure out because I was in my own career was trying to really balance my, you know, the way I be, behavior I acted in a corporate setting versus how I would be, you know, with my friends or family. So I'm really over the years trying to balance that. And I, and I think now I finally have, and I'm trying to lead in that same way with my team. So they feel comfortable, you know, whether it's in a team meeting or in a group setting to be transparent, say what they need, um, and to just be able to be successful as a team and to be able to work together and know that we're, we're, we're doing that as our true selves. Great. So that's that's step one of the process, right? And then what we what we go to now is what everybody knows is the actual timeline um, that you take a candidate through, right? So this this is a really really important um, to keep to the process, and it really gives your candidate a clear path to closure for a new potential job, and also you as as the hiring manager to to keep everything on track. So. First we have is uh, two 30 minute screenings, pretty typical one by the recruiter, one by the hiring manager. And you need to have those within three days of each other, right? Because you wanna keep the momentum going. Once you decide that that um, is the right candidate for you, you're going to book in the panel. The panel will be in within one week of that last uh, 30 minute phone interview. Again, you wanna keep up the momentum and you wanna keep, keep pushing forward with the candidate. Uh, once we have the panel booked in, what we do is within two to three days, we book in a coaching session. So this is, I think, maybe unique to us or maybe everyone is doing it out there. I'm not sure. But we jump on a screen share and we make sure that the candidate is prepared for the presentation. This this does a couple things, right? It shows how prepared they are. It shows how the candidate prepares. Do they wait last minute? Um, are they open to coaching? Are, do you have a strong connection? Are you creative together? It, it really shows you a lot of things. 
The next coaching session is the morning of the presentation. And this for me is my favorite time because you can see the candidate, you can see how you know energized they are, how motivated they are for that job. And you can also see if they took on any of your coaching tips. Uh, so it really, it really does show you a lot throughout the process. So I think this is really the key uh, to, to the difference in, in how we are hiring our candidates. Um, and I think it's a great for a candidate to be, able, to be able to work with you right during this process. So the next part, straightforward panel, if you didn't do any coaching for the presentation, you don't have the panel. Just cancel it, push it forward, and just make sure you're able to coach that candidate um, so they can put their best foot forward at that interview. And final, finally, it ends with the SVP against Gareth Morris. This gives them a great chance to ask any high level questions um, and have that connection so both parties can make sure it's, it's the best fit. Just wanted to show you the proof is in the pudding, right? So the stats are there. We have the data. The, the team was built in 2019. Over 30% of the AEs have been promoted within own backup, which is really important to us. And our attrition is much lower than the industry standard. So this process is working. And lastly, I have a few takeaways, uh, really three main takeaways from this process um, that, that I stick to, right? So standing on the market is a must every speaker is going to speak about this. You have to be engaged uh, with, the, with the candidate. Um, you have to ask yourself, what, I'm, what am I doing today? Is it working? Are they engaged? Are they dropping out of the process? Am I engaged? Um, am, I, am I present? So take a look at that and see if you can maybe implement a video or um, something interactive in the process. Next part, spending time through coaching pays off, right? You could, it's just an hour. But that hour it goes so long and it goes so far and it will be something that you and the candidate will remember um, for as long as you're working together. And then also encourage authenticity during the process. The last thing you want is to show up to your first day on the job and it's different than what you would expect during the interview process. So this is really important um, to us and to me and how we hire. So definitely hope this was helpful. Hope you feel inspired. Um, and if you are looking for a, you know, SaaS selling job in London, let me know. Uh, we are hiring uh, eight people. So shameless plug. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a shameless pl plug, Abby. That's absolutely fine. Well done. Thank you very much. I'm um, I'm really interested. If we get time on the panel, I'm going to ask you about that attrition rate and what you think is contributing to that. I'll, I'll save it until everyone's up because I'd be keen to hear how that compares to other people's experience. But Great job. Thanks for having a really important topic at the moment. So um, I'm sure there's some great takeaways for people in there. So our fourth and our final speaker of the day before we move through to a panel session and then also to our networking is Rebecca Drew. Um, Rebecca is the sales leader EMEA at Vidyard, another exciting up and coming brand in the in EMEA. Um, we've got a lot more weight over in the in, well Canada in the US particularly. Um, Rebecca's title is buyer focused selling and cutting through the noise. She'll be taking us through some industry stats and also some methods of getting your content noticed. Rebecca has 20 years of experience and a career spanning cloud software, management consulting, SaaS, social media, e-learning, and now, of course, Vidyard. And she joined Vidyard in her current role in September last year, charged with growing the team here in EMEA, having previously held leadership roles at A Cloud, a -Cloud Guru and also at LinkedIn as well. Rebecca? Welcome. Another Thank event you. that I'm with, with, with you at. Fantastic to see you. Um, the stage is yours. Off you go. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So let me just quickly share my slides. Here we go. Can everyone uh, see that? Where yeah, we we're good to go. Good stuff. So thank you very much for that introduction, Owen, and hello to everyone who is on the call today. So yeah, Rebecca Drew, I head up our team here at Vidyard in EMEA. Uh, my background, as Owen said, 20 years in sales, and I am incredibly passionate about the way that the sales industry is evolving. So I'm going to talk through today buyer focused selling and cutting through the noise to give you some kind of like context and a, and a bit of a personal story. So in my previous role, when I was looking after the sales team for A Cloud Guru, uh, we were really struggling, right? We were right in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, you know, there was a lot going on and we were trying to book more meetings. We were trying to win more, more deals, which I know everyone is going through that, right? Um, and actually, I implemented uh, Vidyard at my previous company, um, which is one of the reasons why I'm now at Vidyard. So I'm uh, I, I'm now obviously biased because I work for Vidyard, but 
Um, but this is something that um, is, is really interesting um, and something that I'm very passionate about. So I'm going to share with you hopefully some stats today just to give you a bit of food for thought for what's actually going on in the industry and how the industry is evolving and then what you can do about it to really kind of stay ahead of the game, right? Um, so uh, in 2022, uh, as we know, things are not going to get any easier, right? This, this data is from HubSpot. They did an industry benchmark last year. And they can see that actually the number of emails that are being sent. Um, so think about your buyer, right? The number of emails that they're receiving from salespeople has doubled in the last two years. OK, and we can see that uh, response rates have actually gone down by more than 30 percent. I think it's about 37 percent. So there's a lot more noise there out in the market. And you've got to be really cognizant that, you know, your buyers are actually receiving a lot more, um, you know, prospecting emails and things. So. Which, which one of these sort of emails catches your eye, right? So you've got here on the left, you've got a normal sort of text-based uh, prospecting email. Obviously, you can personalize that. You can put a bit more information in there about what your value proposition is, et cetera. And on the right here, you can see there's an actual video um, prospect email. So, you know, the one on the right, I'm curious. I want to know what this person's saying to me. I want to know what, what what's, the, what's the content of the video. And it's all about getting that person to actually click that video for you. And Salesoft did uh, did some analysis into this. So they actually saw that video in your uh, in your outreach actually increases reply rates by about 26 percent. OK, and some teams, I mean, we've seen some crazy stats with some of our clients where they've seen you know response rates go up by almost three times. Right. So there's lots and lots of data here to back it up about how you can stand out from from the crowd. Um, and also, look, buyers are more sophisticated now than they've ever been. Um, you know, they're more researched. Uh, they're doing more due diligence. They're, you know, they're looking at other providers as well. So, you know, the, the sales cycle is taking longer. There's more people involved in the decision. Um, and like I say, there's more due diligence that's happening. So, um, you know, use video as part of your whole process. It's not just a lot of people think that video is just for prospecting. OK, but it can be used throughout this whole sales process. Um, you know, from prospecting through to proposal through to actual kind of post sale as well. And Proposify did a uh, did some analysis on this, and they could see that when people included video as part of that sales process, that close rates actually increased by forty one percent. And in some industries, it was more than a hundred percent. So this can really kind of help you not just to get your foot in the door, but then also how do you how do you kind of increase that engagement and make sure that your clients want to buy from you. Um, and giving them all that information. And there's some examples here of when to use video in sales, right? So um, obviously we've talked about outbound prospecting, make sure that you're standing out uh, in, those, uh, in those buyers' inboxes. Um, also from a, an inbound lead perspective, so how many times have, you know, as an SDR or BDR booked a meeting for us and the clients then not turned up? I think we've all been through that, right? Um, so sending a nice little video ahead of that meeting, just putting a face to the name, building that rapport, really kind of, you know, engaging with that uh, that buyer so that they really want to be on that call um, and you set it up and you've teed it up really, really nicely um, and, and talk through the agenda. Um, throughout the sales cycle, so, you know, it may be like little micro demos that you want to share with the client. You know, buyers are, are busy, right? They don't have time always to get on a call and go through everything all the time. So just in those, those times between those calls, just to be able to add more value, show them something, demonstrate something, um, this can really, really help with those with those close rates. Proposals, obviously, you know, we always want to get a client on a proposal call. Of course we do. Um, but sometimes that's not possible. And sometimes you're not dealing with the actual, you know, decision maker. Um, you know, we always strive to get in front of the decision maker, but it's not always possible. Right. So actually being able to kind of talk through a proposal of, OK, well, this is what you've told us, Mr. Client. This is what's what's most important to your business. And these are the outcomes that you're looking to drive. And then this is how our solution is going to help you to get to that, um, get to those outcomes. And, you know, even providing those proposal videos, if they are then shared internally within your within your client's uh, business and other people within the buying circle, again, that can really, really help you to, to win more business, basically. And then, of course, post-sale, right? So this is all about how do you kind of continue that engagement, uh, your customer success team, for example, or, or anyone else who's client-facing, throughout that post-sale um, post process. So, um, so there's a few things there. Forrester have said asynchronous video is going to be essential um, for, for, for any seller in, uh, in 2021 and beyond. This isn't slowing down. We have a huge kind of like business here. 
there's actually 250,000 uh, companies that are using Vidyard currently. Um, and they've got kind of like business uh, business accounts. But our, our, oh, I've gone the wrong way. Uh, but our platform is free. So if you want to get started with using a video, then uh, sign up. It's free to, it's free to download. There's a Chrome extension that you can use. Um, start using it, record some videos, have fun with it. And, um, and yeah, let us know if you want to know more information. Good stuff. Thanks, Rebecca. Love the plug and a big fan, as you know, of Vidyard um, over here. Um, I think James is going to dot our other speakers back up onto the screen and we're going to kick off into panel. While we're waiting for everyone, Rebecca, there's a question specifically for you that I'll, I'll fire directly at you from Ben Lang, who's put in the comments. Um, sounds great, Rebecca. Is there a greater risk an email will go into junk if there's a video or rich content within it? Perhaps you could answer that one. It is a great question. Um, and it, it it all depends, right? So a lot of companies will have pretty um, pretty strict firewalls, but actually putting a link in the uh, the email is no different to perhaps having some like rich media or text at the bottom of the, the email signature. So it's not a problem that we see a lot with our clients. Um, it does happen occasionally, but you know, you can always kind of you know do a, a normal sort of email and put it in the second step of your of your cadence, for example. And obviously, we also integrate with LinkedIn as well. So you can always send a video message through LinkedIn, uh, a direct message if you're connected to the person. So there's there's ways around it. But generally speaking, it's not an issue that we see very often. It's really good to know. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Ben, as well. Appreciate it. So, guys, firstly, pat on the back. Um, hosted and been a part of these events for a couple of years now. Um, and I think that's the most on time we've had it. So good kudos to you all for sticking to sticking to time today. Gives us lots of time for questions. James might send me a note and let me know how long we've got exactly. But I'll kick into questions first and foremost. Now, all of you threaded something about people and culture within your talks in one way, shape or form. Um, and, and Abby, in particular, you talked about the great resignation. The irony of, of this is that in a market where we've got talk about the great resignation, we've also got talk about it's really hard to find people. So technically, they're leaving businesses and going somewhere. Where on earth are they going? I'd just be keen to just go around each of you and just get a sense of how you're seeing that market at the moment, how much of a challenge it is for you finding people um, versus people moving on from the organization in, in, in a very new market for us all. Abby, I'll come to you because you touched on the great, great resignation first, if that's okay. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. I mean, it, right now, I mean, as you can see, I'm hiring uh, eight AEs that need to be hired today. And mm -hmm. what we're finding is really, if if you have an okay job and then you're telling them you're going to leave, your current employer will, you know, potentially offer you a promotion or additional salary to stay, uh, which is great because I mean, we're every employer is in that same predicament. So. I think really as a candidate, you need to fully understand what you want out of your career and and, and you need to, to stay stay firm on that. <laughs> so that's what we're seeing. And I, I mean, I appreciate it, right? Because I wish I was at the start of my career when it was like this. Mm -hmm. um, but I appreciate what's happening right now, but it's a very tough market to hire new yeah. people. Anders, what's your, what's your take on it? Yeah, I think this is a, it's a very, very interesting topic. And I, and I guess there's there's more demand than, than there is uh, yeah, uh, sellers out there to be filled. So it, it feels like it's it's more a natural thing that there is more more sales teams that need sales reps than there are reps out there. Uh, so that is one. I also think the, the remote setup that we had uh, during COVID just exploded the, the number of possibilities of possible uh, employers that a, a sales rep can work for. So that has also changed a lot. Um, but I, I'm a little bit old school. I also think that we maybe as uh, sales leaders and, and uh, business leaders need to maybe focus a little bit more on how actually nice it is to have a person that is loyal and actually stays for three to four or five, even five years in a company. I think that says a lot about that person and they get so much more deep into that company and is a part of a growth journey. So sometimes it feels like we're maybe... Uh, putting too much value on, on, uh, on um, yeah, uh, maybe careers that have more, more, uh, um, uh, f fewer uh, months on each each company. Yeah. Uh, so that is at least what I, I, I try to find, and I think that Chris, I'll come to you. That's a really good take on that? Thanks, Anders. Chris, I'll come to you. Yes. Any take on that? Yeah. Um, so I definitely agree with the the sentiment around 
the war for talent. I think um, the, there's three things we've probably found uh, that we've really needed to double down on in the last year in particular. One is speed. So the speed at which we need to move through the interview process um, has needed to be shortened enormously. So one thing that we've done is um, whilst trying to retain the employee experience, which I'll come on to in a second, we've tried to compress our recruitment cycle down significantly. So an initial call with a VP for like the 30 minutes, just to talk them through peak and let them ask any questions to check it's a good fit for them. We can sense check cultural fit. And then we move on to like an hour and a half, two hour, try and compress the first and second interview together and then move directly to a founder interview. And we try and do that in about two weeks. Um, the second thing is probably we we've needed to hit more channels than ever before um in terms of creating talent pipeline mm -hmm. so and what i mean by that is like really doubling down on the best recruiters in the market um really doubling down on like employees putting out videos to capture the imagination of people on linkedin and things like that which is why i love what abby was talking about as part of the hiring experience as well um and the final thing i'd say is thinking about the employee experience as we do customer experience and i think both abby and rebecca have, have touched on that equally um but putting the same amount of effort into thinking how how do we um ensure that the candidate always has like all of the assets at their disposal to understand exactly what the benefits are of making the move answer any questions they may have make them feel comfortable about um, you know, what is a huge moment in their life to make that transition. Um, so all of those things together, I think, have, have helped us gradually get to where we need to be, but it's not been easy at all over the mm -hmm. last year, and we're only just getting to, like, the volume of people we want. Thanks, Chris. Rebecca, anything to add? Yeah, absolutely. So I used to work in the talent solutions business at LinkedIn, so this is a, a topic that's very close to my heart. Uh, so firstly, um, just do a bit of an audit on your employer brand. Like, what is it? Um, what are people seeing? Like, what's attractive to you as a business? Um, you really need to make sure that, you know, people are, people can see who you are and how authentic you are and what the opportunity is there. Absolutely. get. I couldn't agree more, Chris. Get a great recruitment partner, whether that's an internal person that you're working with or an external business. Um, pipeline, pipeline, pipeline. All right. Okay. I'm really kind of deliberate. I, um, I will go out my way to meet with um, salespeople, um, whether I'm working with them and, and being, you know, kind of mentoring them or anything like that. So re like really think about how you build that pipeline so that when you do have those roles available, you've just got a constant stream of people that you can that you can tap into. Um, and the other thing as well is just I have to I have to say around diversity. OK, don't always look for everything that's already in your kind of in your sales team. Right? OK, be creative. Think about people from different backgrounds, different experiences. Um, you know, uh, hire for, for potential, not always just because they've been an account executive in a, you know, in a SaaS business. Some of the best people that I've hired have come from diverse backgrounds. So, um, yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you. And I think um, I'd like to, if it's okay, take us back to two points or a point that's been touched on by, by both Abby and Anders there. One is, Abby, in your talk, you talked about the 17% seven, attrition. I told you I'd take you back there if I could. And Anders, you just touched on in lo the loyalty of, of people at a time where it's hard to attract talent and keep that pipeline full, suddenly retention of existing employees becomes a more important strategy. Just be keen to, to understand. I'll go round again, just a minute each. Um, you know, what, what are you doing? What are you thinking about in that area? What have you found that's worked? And Abby, for you, 17%, what do you think is contributing to that? What are the things that are, you know, the, the biggest things that are contributing to that? So Abby, I'll start with you again, if that's all right. 17% is great. How are you doing that? Perfect. I love being first. It's been yeah. great. <laughs> no, I think, okay, so this might, might sound cliche, but it does come back to our values. Like one of our values is we take our work seriously, but not ourselves. Like, I mean, that resonates with people, right? We care about everything we do. We build trust through transparency. Like we're always moving forward. Like we really embody those at Own Backup and we have the best product in the market. So, and it's not a nice to have, you need to have you know, a Salesforce backup, Microsoft, you need a backup. So I think it really comes to the, the company culture, like everyone says, but really the product too backs it. So it's like, well, why wouldn't you want to be at own backup? Why wouldn't you want to grow with them? It's a unicorn. Um, it's just a great place to be. Brilliant. Rebecca, I'm going to come back to you and mix the order up because otherwise I'm just going around the same same route. And what, what are you thinking about, about keeping people? Because you got, I know you've got a small team in, the, in, in EMEA that's growing quickly. 
yeah. huge over in Canada. But you know, what's the what's the perception on sort of keeping those people? What's the strategy for doing that? Yeah, I think um, to Abby's point, I think culture and values are so important. That's what keeps people in businesses, as you know, in my experience. I think it's about creating an environment that is um, psychologically safe for the team and that they understand that they can come and talk to you about things. Um, and, and really, it's about, you know, people want to develop, they want to progress, they want to keep learning and, 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 uh, and move forward. So really being deliberate around um, how are you putting them on that development path um, where they've got goals that they can strive to and you're supporting and coaching and through that, but then also that you're giving them interesting things to do. I call them kind of extracurricular activities, like interesting projects that they're doing that's having a real impact to the business yeah. and creating that, that environment of collaboration and that they know what their impact is to the business. I think that's key. Thank you, Chris. You are right to go, go next. Anything to add? Yeah, I agree massively on the points around values and um, enablement. We talk a lot about the like every single rep, every single SDR, every single pre-sales consultant should be worth more and more valuable in the market at the end of a year than they are at the start of the year. And it's it's ultimately on us to make sure we enable them and coach them to, to be um, more effective and, and more valuable. Um, the one thing I'd add on top of what Rebecca and Abby have said is is around vision, like having a really compelling vision. That there's a lot of noise in the market currently, um, and what one of the big things at peak. I mean, we're pioneering um, the most important B two B technology of a generation in the decision intelligence platform. So it, having that compelling vision that people can wrap around and and see and and uh, kind of it resonates on a on a daily weekly basis when you. When you're talking about the goals of the of the company and the OKRs that you're trying to achieve, thank thank you, Anders. I'm keen to come to you because you touched on this about people that have been there three, four, five years. Of course, as a reasonably young organisation, that's really hard. You've got a team of people that have only been there a couple of years max on the most part when you're when you're that early stage but growing quickly. So loyalty becomes really important because you haven't got those people that have been around a decade to teach others. So I'm guessing this you brought it up. It must be a key focus of yours. Yeah, I think, and I think everyone tries to do that, right? And we we don't always succeed. Uh, we have we have our attrition too, but but I think um, to touching upon loyalty, I think that's it's a trait that I really think is really nice, and and I think that we should value it more as employers as well. So everyone should be able to have a nice dialogue about what is their next step, and that we believe in them, and that everyone feels like it's okay to have their ups and downs. That's that's mm -hmm. the profession we're in. Um, but stick around and then the future will be bright. So I think that all of us in the sales community would, would uh, elevate and reach our goals. If the general attrition would be more maybe in the 20s rather than in the 35, that, that HubSpot mm -hmm. says that the average is, I think it's it's just super high. We need yeah. to get that down somehow. Uh, it's uh, Yeah, that's at least. Thank you. Um, yeah. Are you all hiring at the moment? I know, Abby, you are. Rebecca, I know you are from our other conversations. Chris, and yep. you're hiring at the moment, I assume. Oh, yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everyone. Always. Everyone always. So you're an interesting concept. We're always hiring. We're always on. And it doesn't feel like we need one or two people. We need a, a lot of people across all of our organizations this year. We're all going to be out there battling in the market to try and attract people and bring people in. And it's getting harder and harder. Where's the point of compromise? So, Abby, your point is all around giving people the best experience, but also yeah, making sure you're getting the right candidate. There's a temptation as a sales leader to start to compromise on quality at some point because you've got quota to hit, you've got growth goals to hit. And do you need a, do you need a bum in the seat who's maybe 80% right instead of 100% right? I'm just keen to just throw that out there. I, don't, I, don't, I won't give you my opinion on it, but maybe just understand whether you guys have a backup plan that at some point you have to start thinking differently about it. And do I need to change the types of people I need? Do I need to compromise? Do I need to start with people who are earlier stage, less experienced, to just try and drive that head count and get activity happening? Abby, you're nodding away. Sorry to come to you first again, but I will. Yeah, no, but you're, you're yeah. saying all the right things. And like, so it, it's two of those things, right? It's about since COVID, like location really doesn't matter. Let's, let's rethink how we think about being in office and not. Like we all want to be in the office together. That's great. So let's make it happen. Number two is... I'm not going to sacrifice on on quality, but what I will do is if I find the right candidate that is that doesn't have enough work experience, I would rather hire them. So now what we're doing, just like you said, earlier stage in their sales career. So mm -hmm. I see the attributes that we want on the team. Yeah, you're hired. So not going yeah. to sacrifice. 
Yeah. And what about paying more? Are you, are, you, are you going up the food chain in terms of salaries and that kind of stuff to make sure you win those people in early if they're out competing looking at other jobs? Yeah, I mean, it's just like sales. You're not going to lose on price, right? Yeah. Yeah. But... Fair enough. Um, <laughs> Anders, I'll come, I'll come to you. What about you? What are you, are you, are you? Would you plan on compromising or are you holding your standards high and no compromise? I think if uh, we only recruit the ones that we are 100% certain of, then the speed is probably not there. We need to, 80% is maybe a little bit too low, but if we're in the 90s, I think that's uh, good to go. Um, yeah. So yeah. we try to have a, a scientific approach to recruitment as well. So we always do, of course, a different tests. Uh, yeah. So we don't just look at the, the, the CVs in the background. And then we also do uh, live interviews where they are actually yeah, we can see them, how they are actually doing, <clears throat> conducting sales meetings and so on. So we, we, we try to hire a lot on, uh, on on personal skills and what their abilities might be in the future rather than where they are right now. And uh, yeah, so I'm yeah. I'm always willing to give a, especially maybe a junior candidate, a shot. And that has worked really well in the, yeah. in, in the past as well. Chris? Exactly the same as Abby. Uh, mm. No compromise. Um, uh, and very similarly, we've we've um, increasingly given opportunities to more junior members of the team that have actually turned out to be incredible um, mm. and really pushed the standards of what we thought was possible within the team. So I'd massively encourage that if you've got some um, absolute firecrackers in your team that are pushing mm. you to have the opportunity to be an AE as an example, give it to them. Um, and then, yeah, same as Rebecca said, looking at transferable industries or looking slightly outside of the typical blueprint to see if there's there's other types of candidates we can find. And of course, that internal um, promotion drives the thing that Anders is talking about, which is that loyalty piece, because they're moving forward mm -hmm. faster. But of course, be careful of the promote before they're ready piece, which I've seen go wrong several times. You know, you promote people to the point of failure and they leave very quickly. And it's finding that that balance. But I was having a conversation with somebody today about the fact that there are often people internally, we look at them and hold them to different standards. So those that we would out externally coming in for an interview, um, for some reason it warps our thinking. And I think it's a really good sanity check to just step back from it sometimes. Rebecca, sorry to dive in there. Anything to add on this topic? Uh, no, I'd, I'd just say, um, you know, I've, I've definitely, uh, I've made bad hires in my time and I've learned my mm. lessons. So there is no compromise. You always try and, uh, and strive for perfection, but it's not, uh, it's not realistic. And every now and then, uh, you do get kind of like some people through the net who uh, maybe weren't right for your organization. So uh, yeah, no compromise. And we've spoken about this before, but the four things that I kind of look for, the four attributes, mm -hmm. the curiosity, uh, commitment, uh, and that's commitment to themselves and to the business, um, coachability, and uh, and then also collaboration as well. So if they've got those those four things, then I can work with them and we can we can do great things. Really nice. Well, guys, look, thank you very much. And there's some great points from all of your talks that, that I've written down and taken away. And I'm sure that the audience has. There was a, a question I didn't manage to throw in about partnerships. Rebecca, thank you for taking the time to answer that in writing in the comments. Guys, if you have partnership um, teams and you're seeing success in that, Benedict uh, has posted a, a, a question up in the comments at 4.08 p.m. Um, asking about collaboration between sales and partnerships. If you've got the time to just add a, add a few comments and you've got a partnership team that's successful i'd love for you to do that um for, for benedict other than that thank you very much for helping with the answers to those questions and for your talks today guys very much appreciated james i'll hand back to you thanks very much everybody um i really appreciate your efforts it wouldn't be possible to put on these events without the speakers um so round of applause and if we can get some round of applause from the audience just to highlight how fantastic it's been to have a really well-run organized event it makes it a much more um good you know positive experience for the audience when it runs on time and so i'm glad that we've run on time today um uh, just to highlight that sales confidence will be back in person on the 23rd of march at the andes hotel so we will be running our in-person events on the 23rd of march at the andes hotel i've left the link in the comments so you can buy your tickets now um, we will expect about 200 people in person. And it looks like COVID's clearing up, um, at least here in the UK. So hopefully there's more opportunity to network. I just had a private comment from someone saying how good it is to provide these type of events to provide connection because so many of us are at home not connecting with people as often we were before. And that's the reason why we do in person, to give you that opportunity to build your network and see 
what others are doing in the industry and have a drink because that's a lot more fun um, than just sitting at home in your pajamas. Um, so thank you very much once again. Um, we're now going to move on to the networking. Um, so there's an opportunity to see, there's a tab on the right called networking. Speakers, you'll have to log into where we registered to get access to the networking section. And there's a networking tab. Um, obviously, as speakers, you're going to get a lot of the uh, audience that are going to want to talk to you. So do hang around for 15 or 20 minutes or so and say hello. Um, and that's a wrap. So once again, thank you, everybody, for being involved. Uh, thank you, speakers, for your time and contribution. And thank you to the audience for coming along to our event today. Take care, everyone.